Office Space asks the question, if you are not happy with your life, why do you keep doing the same old things, the same old ways, getting the same old results, which some have labeled the definition of insanity? Is it hope that compels you to stick it out, or is it fear that keeps you in that rut? That's right, today we're talking about Office Space from 1999, a highly influential film on the industry and to 14-year-old me awaiting a life of working in an office. Hey, I'm Chris, and I'm talking about workplace film and television shows on my channel, taking a look at the story and the deeper meaning. So if that's your thing, you know, you can hit that subscribe button. With that, let's go. Yeah. That's it. That's exactly what I need. Uh-huh. Yeah, give it to me. Come on, you little f Let's go. That's what I need. Let's do that. Let's do exactly that, you little f Like most other tales of hopelessness and desperation, we open up in Texas as our lethargic hero, Peter Gibbons, an emotionally locked up and disgruntled and unmotivated programmer, is thwarted at every attempt to get ahead of his fellow man. Every move he makes leads him to being stuck, watching everyone else pass him by. It's a great joke and a perfect way to show the deeper state of mind that Peter's in. We meet his friend Samir, who vents his anger on his car, which is one of his only character traits in this film, and his other friend Michael, who's rapping in his car until he has a bout of insecurity, seemingly both the emotional and physical variety. Following their drive, we see the three of them work at a tech firm called Inatech, which I don't think I ever thought of before now, is a cross between initiative and technology, which again is a layered joke spoofing on the stupid technology firm names that are very much still a thing today. You know Aviato? Is there any other Aviato? Well, legally there cannot be. And initiative, which is something our main character is definitely lacking. As he walks into the office, he has to pass a front row spot where his douchey boss occupies with his douchey car and his douchey dual tone collar thing. I hate those shirts. So glad they're not in vogue anymore. And as he comes into the office, he has this little punishing reminder of how terrible every day is going to be. As he sits in his cube, the sound engineering of the film begins to shine through. The clicks of the keyboard, the mice, the neighbors all begin to rise, along with the blood pressure of Peter and any other poor empathetic individual who's watching this film. Corporate accounts payable, Nina speaking. Anyone who's worked in a cubicle farm knows how this is. We get the repetitive gal across the way, and we get a little introduction to Milton. Could you turn that down just a little bit? Well, I, I was told that I could listen to the radio at a reasonable volume from 9 to 11. But I've worked with all kinds. Dudes who clip their fingernails in the office. Another guy who used to fall asleep in his cube every single afternoon. And I'd have this internal battle over what was like the kinder and less socially awkward thing to do like do you wake him up and spare his future embarrassment or like not wake him up and just act like i didn't know he'd fallen asleep in the first place what gets me out of this with the least amount of guilt and the least amount of having to deal with people as possible but peter's jarred awake from his rising blood pressure with his boss there to talk to him about mistakenly using an old cover letter for a tps report while tps reports is what everyone remembers from this film this also hits on the multi-boss thing that these organizations have when I first started in my company, I was a junior employee. I had a business analyst who I was responsible to report to, as she was kind of the go-between the customers and me. I also had two senior developers that I was also accountable to for how I did my work and to make sure that I was using all the right code, all the tech assets, all that kind of stuff. I also had a project manager who was the go-between our bosses and me, who I also had to give reports to. And speaking of bosses, I had a manager, I had a director, and I had a vice president, each requiring some level of reporting from me about the work that I was doing. So this TPS thing is a great bit, and it works so well in all the jokes throughout this film, but this whole multi-boss thing definitely triggers my response from those early days in my career. I have eight different bosses right now. Eight, Bob. So that means that when I make a mistake, I have eight different people coming by to tell me about it. 
So Peter, in fact, does have a case of the Mondays. Somebody's got a case of the Mondays. And he goes over to his buds who share a cube due to writing convenience. And the trio dip out for a quick cup of coffee at the local Applebee's knockoff. Knockoff number one, at least which again works on two different levels. Uh, this introduces us to Peter's crush on Rachel, which isn't her name in the film, but that's what I'm gonna call her for the rest of this video. But this trip also does subtly invoke one of the most interesting concepts about the deeper meaning of office space. These three dudes, within a matter of moments, getting into the office, settling into their workday, have the freedom to just get up, leave their desk, and go walk across their industrial park to Applebee's knockoff number one for what is for sure some terrible coffee. That's a convenience that many jobs just wouldn't allow, but it becomes clear that Peter's only focused on the negatives, something his friends don't quite see eye to eye with. I'm a big pussy, which is why I work at Inatech to begin with. Uh, yeah, well, I work at Inatech and I don't consider myself a pussy, okay? Yes, I am also not a pussy. The main catalyst for the plot is then revealed in their conversation. Peter is in a struggling relationship with someone named Anne, and everyone seems to think that she's cheating on Peter. She has an idea to have Peter see a hypnotherapist about his work-related depression. Again, something his friends aren't exactly seeing eye to eye with him on. Dude. An occupational hypnotherapist? Yeah, I, I know. Office Space first act works so well because every second of screen time is layered with such great humor as well as the experience of working in an office and then also some rich story building. Peter reveals a fear that his boss is going to make him work on Saturday, something that thankfully I've been able to avoid for most of my career, though I've definitely spent some late nights where I burned the midnight oil, all that stuff to learn some new tech so I could show off some new capability that ultimately did not help me advance my career whatsoever. We could talk about that a whole different time. Peter attempts to duck out before the boss can ask him, which again, it exhibits some level of privilege that Peter just doesn't seem to pick up on, that he could just leave early and not have to tell anybody and there basically be no consequences. I generally come in at least 15 minutes late. Maybe. But his departure is delayed by the greatest Mac OS joke the late 90s put to film. Come on. Oh, for crap. Then we cut to Peter's hypnotherapy session. By the way, who are these people? I don't think it's ever addressed. I think she maybe brought her friends to Peter's therapy session, which seems bad. But also, what is the consensus of hypnotherapy in 2023? Anyone have anything credible to watch to explain if this is like real? I just assume that this is mentalist stuff most of the time, like how the Jedi mind trick only works for the weak minded. It's revealed that Anne doesn't really believe in this stuff either. And speaking of that consensus, what's everyone's thoughts on what actually happens during this session? Does something mystical happen, liar liar style, or is this guy just really good at his job? I mean, he did help Anne lose weight. Peter, she's anorexic. Yeah, I know. The guy's really good. Either way, the doc dies during his duty and the snap awake moment never occurred. So it leaves Peter no longer in a state of conscious turmoil. And with his newfound apathy, Peter sleeps in all Saturday. And when he wakes up, he does the most 90s thing ever. Yeah, hi, it's Bill Lump. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which Cole told in an interview with The Ringer way back in the day that people still come up to him quoting that single drawn out word, sometimes on a daily basis. Yeah, hi, it's Bill Lumber. Which, if you see Gary Cole, I can't fault you for doing that, but maybe don't. I think I will go with, if you ain't first, you're last. Peter's not only in hot water with his boss, though. His girlfriend's also not thrilled with his behavior over the last 24 hours. And she confirms the fears that Peter fretted days before. I've been cheating on you! But now his fears have no bearing on him. So much so that in his first act of this new life of freedom is to go brazenly ask Rachel to a day date at Applebee's stand-in number two. Chilies or, or flingers? Flingers. Which they do, and they have some chemistry. And something about his newfound vagabond philosophy just does it for her, I guess. Way to go, Peter. Back at the office, the scuttlebutt is that Inatech is bringing in a new consulting firm to help optimize operations, which of course spurs rumors of downsizing. 
rumors in this case which are very much rooted in reality, with two-on-one interviews beginning almost immediately, and this sequence rang in my head every time I ever had to deal with that business analyst and project manager that I mentioned before. You take the specifications from the customers and you bring them down to the software engineer. I deal with the goddamn customers so the engineers don't have to. I have people skills. Again, I don't necessarily have any firsthand experiences with a firm like this. Our joke was always that you should fear the call to the first floor on a Friday afternoon. We find it's always better to fire people on a Friday. But one thing I noticed while watching Office Space for this review was that in a tech's primary source of funding, at least during when the story is set, is Y2K related contracts, meaning that all of these people, every single one of them, unless the company drastically changes course in the next several months to diversify its portfolio, are going to be without a job. So while there would be some cleanup work still to perform for all these companies in the new millennium, uh, Inatech's bread and butter was just about to run out. So this consulting thing is just the first round of many upcoming layoffs, which does add to that layer of fear, dread, and paranoia that everyone's exhibiting in this film. What the hell is wrong with you people? I fear, dread, and paranoia that Peter is now free from. Nothing says it's pre-cell phone age as when Peter comes into the office just to grab a piece of paper to write down Rachel's phone number, something I can really remember doing in high school. I'm dashing home just to remember some girl's phone number. I doubt anybody from my high school watches this. Michael Bolton spots him and lets him know that he's supposed to be in with the Bobs right now. Hi, Bob. Bob. Leading to one of the most delightful sequences in the film and something that was heavily spotlit in the trailers. Peter, 100% unfettered, is unfiltered in his answers to the Bobs, who, keep in mind, have been dealing with people who act like this all day. What would you say? You do here. Well, look, I already told you. I deal with the goddamn customers. Let's get down to business, Michael. You know, you, you can just call me Mike. So to them, Peter's a straight shooting guy who really sees an attack for what it is. And to Peter, he just really doesn't care what the bobs do or don't do. And cutting the meeting off early is by far one of my most favorite moments. Listen, I'm gonna go. Uh, it's been really nice talking to both of you guys. <laughs> Absolutely. Good luck with your layoffs, all right? I hope your firings go really well. Peter grabs his phone number, jukes out Lumberg, and steps out of the office. Meanwhile, Rachel's getting her own bit of corporate culture clobbering. Well, okay, 15 is the minimum, okay? Okay. Now, you know, it's up to you whether or not you want to just do the bare minimum. Peter's new outlook on life, though, has him on the up and up, watching kung fu, fishing, gutting that fish on TPS reports, and giving himself a window seat. Lumberg comes up asking him again for the infamous reports and Peter's busy eating crunchy Cheetos and playing Tetris and tells his boss to scurry off, <laughs> which gets me every time too. Look, I'm gonna have to ask you to go ahead and just come back another time. I got a meeting with the Bobs in a couple of minutes. Leading to the best line of the film. Looks like you've been missing a lot of work lately. I wouldn't say I've been missing it, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> for whatever reason, the Bobs have submitted that Peter should get a promotion into lower middle management, and they begin to discuss the people that they're laying off, a list which includes Peter's friends. I think at this moment, Peter's actually woken up from the hypnotherapy. This epiphany makes Peter realize just how evil an attack is. He tells his friends they're being fired and uses that mental state to agree to rip off the company using a threat that Mr. Bolton has touted all film. That's a few hundred thousand dollars. It's like Superman 3. The plan is hatched, agreed to, and then executed on pretty easily. On the way out of the office, somehow Peter swipes the real symbol, and this is real talk, real life. Peter swipes the real symbol of corporate greed from the office. Soon thereafter, Peter breaks the pack of silence on his way to the barbecue and tells Rachel about this scheme, which he's not super thrilled about. At that barbecue, someone lets slip that Rachel and Lumberg used to have a thing way back in the day, which sets Peter off who equates Lumberg with everything that's wrong and evil in corporate America. He seems less concerned with her sexual past and more concerned about her judge of character, which doesn't quite read that way to Rachel in the two part ways, kicking off the real low point of the film as Peter wakes up on Monday morning expecting just 
I don't know, some amount of change added to their account, instead he finds hundreds of thousands of dollars. Realizing that his actions are now responsible for wrecking his friend's life, he decides that he's going to fall on his sword and take the blame for the scandal and spare his friends entirely. But a mistreated employee of Inatac, Milton, who we've seen in bits throughout the film, barges into Lumberg's office and apparently found the cashier's checks Peter left under the door. And then he sets the entire office on fire. With all the evidence up in smoke, everyone's acquitted of their crimes. Peter makes a career change, but his buddies still work in tech with one of Inatac's competitors down the street, surely just awaiting to be laid off later that year either way. I'm actually an unemployed software engineer. I make more money selling magazine subscriptions than I ever did in this road. Peter reveals that he's patched things up with Rachel as Rex Quando finds Milton Stapler. A smile washes over Peter's face, almost as though he knows the stapler seems to represent that thing that can make your job worthwhile. For Peter, it seems to be purpose. For Michael, it was anonymity. And for Samir, it was security. For Oswald, it's two chicks at the same time, man. But that, of course, leads us to the deeper meaning. Fucking A. Fucking A. What does a bean mean? Someone please explain it to Kat. Human beings were not meant to sit in little cubicles staring at computer screens all day filling out useless forms and listening to eight different bosses drone on about mission statements. I don't normally like to jump to conclusions, but Peter is a wreck when this movie opens up. He seems caught between two very real and present fears, the fear of the unknown and FOMO or fear of missing out, which are two completely contradictory fears. And that's a testimony to not only how deep this film is, but it's also a marvel of the human condition. Our anxiety organs balancing out two vastly different fears can absolutely lead a human to feel trapped. Peter's terrified of a life lived poorly, of missing out on what he thinks life is. He says as much with the whole, what would you do if you had a million dollars thing? I would do nothing. But once he's presented with that opportunity to live like he had a million dollars, he does things. He takes Rachel fishing, he watches Kung Fu, and he earns a promotion in the meantime. It seems like what he really wants is a life that means something. And that the only thing that's stopping him from living that life is that he seems to be afraid of actually stepping out into the unknown. Because that involves risk. There's this undertone in the film in which the Lumbergs of the world have arrived. And if you just work harder, put in your time, do the TPS reports correctly 100% of the time, then your time will inevitably come too. You will have arrived. And if you keep the faith, you will be rewarded. A promise that leads to hope. Hope that leads to perseverance. Perseverance that can make a person forsake all of the red flags that they see around them and just keep on keeping on. This is all true in Peter's office space as well as in his relationship space. So Peter has a desire to pursue a life well lived as well as a fear of losing what he actually has, which let's be honest, at the start of the film, it's not much. I mean, I'm not 100% sure what these opportunity guides on his fridge are meant to imply, but I'm guessing it has something to do with his desire to get out of the situation he's currently living in. Nobody wants to live in Texas. I'm sorry, that's the subtext of this film. I love the way that he lives in an apartment, though. It's signifying that he's not firmly rooted anywhere, though Judge doesn't really pull any punches on the suburb life either. You know that tiny slice of land that you can call your own with its amazing views? But in that lies the key to unlocking the message of this film. Perspective matters. Mustachioed guy whose name I forgot and I'm too lazy to look up. Tom Sinkowski. I've known guys like this. So stressed at every little thing. I have a friend in my job. I love this guy. He was a project manager for a brief time. And I swear I told the guy to relax on a daily basis. He'd come up and I couldn't tell if he was doing this as like a bit or if he was just addicted to stress or what. But he would come up with these mundane minor issues like, like, Chris, I, I, 
they told I'm t- they said they can't do it until Friday. And I'd be like, hey, man, it's cool. No big deal. Friday's great. Let's go. We're not splitting atoms here. <laughs> We're not stopping the plague, buddy. No one's dying. We got this. Friday's perfect. Dude had something similar to a stroke, and it wrecked him for a bit. Thankfully, he's all good and seems to have changed his perspective. And, you know, he seems overall pretty happy and doing well. Because thankfully, that situation seems to have given him some perspective. That issues are on a scale of 1 to 10, and not everything is on the higher end of that scale. A mustachioed guy was ready to end it all after he was laid off, probably because he connects his identity and thus his self-worth to his job. Being laid off made him good for nothing. And that's a tragedy. And, you know, there's always people to talk to if that's ever how you feel about that. But that's the point, right? He tries to execute a plan, but he gets that dose of perspective. You okay, Tom? Then as he's looking at her, yeah. He decides he wants to live. And this is seen when they're at the barbecue. He's literally all banged up, in cast, everything from his accident. But he says, If you hang in there long enough, good things can happen in this world. I mean, look at me. <laughs> all movie long, Peter is whining about his life, something that most of the people around him are either annoyed or just confused by. But none of that matters because humans have this fantastic way of turning our perspective into our reality. Peter focuses only on the negative things, and that's all he experiences. Not that he has a stable job that allows him to come and go as he wishes with virtually no oversight, which might sound like a contradiction to the film, but if you think about all the things I already called out, he really does have a lot of freedoms in this career. But instead of focusing on the good, he only focuses on the Mondays and Milton. Milton is a character who's central to the story of both the making of this film, but also the film's plot in general. It seems to represent this little internal voice of how much can you really take before you choose which of those fears is going to win out. Because while we can't actually change our reality, we can change our perception of that reality, which if our perceptions define reality means that in a way we can actually change reality, which is kind of cool. Not for real, but but I think to get there, something's got to give. Back to Milton. First, the desk is shuffled around, then the stapler's taken, then his paycheck stop arriving, then he's moved to the basement, a concrete jungle that serves as his rock bottom moment for the character, which also, by the way, mimics Peter's rock bottom moment of realizing that not only is his apathetic life not leading to a simple life, he's also turning into a bad person. What are you? You think you're some kind of like angel here? No, you're just this penny stealing wannabe criminal man. Peter learns to give a shit about the things that matter, to step out of his comfort zone and seize the day. And that seizure looks different for all of us. Ooh, boom, face. Like I said in the beginning, office space has had a huge impact on me. So many things have happened since I started working in the office place years ago. And so much of that has called me back to this film as I quietly find refuge from the chaos in references from office space. And then on the flip side, watching this movie now reminds me of so many memories from my career. Like this one joke. Next Friday is Hawaiian shirt day. It reminded me of a time where I worked for National Bank's call center. We had to wear khakis and a button up every single day, even though we didn't see any customers ever. It was just the corporate culture. It was the policy. Except when the Cardinals were in the playoffs. Those days, you could pay a buck to charity and wear jeans and a Cardinals-themed t-shirt. I always loved those days, but I'll also always remember the day I walked in super excited to wear jeans and a Cards tee, and the guy who I swear to everything that you might consider holy that it was this guy. He looked just like him. He walked up to me in the lobby and he said, hey, what are we doing? I'm like, getting ready to go into work. Mind you, I'm 22 or 23 at this point, I'm not sure. And I'm telling you with all of the authority that a late aged middle manager of a national bank's call center could muster, he looked at me and said, not in those, you're not. <laughs> I was like, 
Oh, but the Cardinals are, Cardinals are playing today, right? And he said, afraid not. Better go home and change. I was like, man, I live 30 minutes away. I'd be an hour late to work if I did that. Are you sure this is worth that? He said, yep. <laughs> I like walked out of the building. Thankfully, my brother lived five minutes away and I was just able to sneak into his house and grab a pair of khakis that I never replaced to him. I hate that story, but I also love that story because it it means something to me. It's like a stamp in my timeline that this was the office place culture. It's what they cared about at this point in time. It wasn't long after that that I was wearing jeans and a button up every single day then jeans and a t-shirt every single day, then pajamas every day for a while. But beyond the dumb things that Office Space makes me think of, I always took away that Chill Peter was promoted because he stood out. The Bobs, who lack any real depth except their oddly specific love for Michael Bolton, are basically the same person. In fact, most people you see around the office are just doing their absolute best to not be noticed which is kind of Michael Bolton's entire thing. Peter's behavior is rewarded because he's above the noise. And that's something I've always tried to incorporate into my career. I don't really care about TPS reports. I don't really care about the Mondays. And I really don't care about the mundane details. I care about getting my job done well, enjoying my day and providing for and making it home to the people I love. While I think that the third act of the film does break the pacing a bit, Office Space is a classic film that stirs up emotions and memories in me with laughs and layered storytelling. Judge's ability to create hilarious and thought-provoking satire on so many different aspects of life is something that I've always respected. While I never got into King of the Hill, my kid was watching this the other day and I saw Hank say this. Megalo Mark. Well, why don't you just go down to hell and work for the devil? And I've been laughing about it for weeks. Judge was also a big part of the Silicon Valley series of the late 2010s and something I plan to be covering soon on this channel. One of the things I found difficult for this review was writing a script that didn't just include every single thought I have about this film. There's so many different directions I could have taken it. But I want to know your thoughts. What did you like about this video? What do you disagree with? What do you think the deeper meaning of Office Space is? And if you have any other ideas for things about Office Space you'd like me to talk about or any other office or workplace TV series or film that you think I should talk about next, leave it in the comments. I wanna thank the patrons for supporting this channel, making videos like this possible. Thanks everyone for watching and we'll see you next time.